Hey, uh, good morning, everybody, to the uh, 17th Annual Mario Verani Lectureship. I just have to say a few words uh, before we get going. Um, uh, in terms of surveys, uh, completion of surveys is important to maintain CME accreditation and continue to deliver appropriate content, so please uh, do that. And uh, this is going to be videotaped and video conferenced. Um, we're a live stream and we're, we're on Facebook Live. Uh, and um, please, when, if you have any questions at the end, use the microphones to ask questions so that everyone can, can hear it on the live stream. And uh, all of this live streaming will be available for you on YouTube immediately after the event. And uh, also, uh, we now offer AB, ABIM MOC credits. Uh, so you just need to know about that in case you, uh, you want to uh, go down that route. So uh, it's my pleasure this morning to uh, again uh, talk to you about uh, our lectureship, uh, the Mario Verani lectureship. Uh, Dr. Verani, as many of you may or may not know, uh, was director of cardiology, uh, of nuclear cardiology here uh, back in 1984. And, uh, and was uh, director of the lab for some 17 years before uh, he passed away from pancreatic cancer in 2001. Um, he was truly a leader in nuclear cardiology. Uh, he was an international speaker for the field as well as cardiology in general. And uh, he made some tremendous accomplishments in nuclear cardiology. Uh, one of which, not, uh, without standing, was the introduction of adenosine as a uh, pharmacologic stressor agent. Uh, and as you may or may not know, uh, in nuclear cardiology, somewhat around 60% of people can't exercise on a treadmill. And pharmacologic uh, stress testing really allowed the field to expand and develop and gave flexibility uh, to being able to image our patients and identify ischemic myocardium in a very efficient manner. So, uh, Dr. Verani was one of the uh, was one of the first to really to to uh, utilize adenosine and and promote its use as a as a way of stressing people using myocardial perfusion imaging. Mario was also uh, one of the first um, presidents of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology. Uh, he wrote numerous book chapters. He had over 200 publications on, in peer-reviewed journals, and he was. Uh, Really a wonderful uh, person, uh, excellent educator, and, uh, and a thought leader uh, in nuclear cardiology. So every year we, uh, we honor him with this, with this lectureship. Today we are very pleased uh, to have Dr. Uh, Moaz Amala uh, give this year's Verani lectureship. Uh, Dr. Amala, uh, I have known for many, many years. Uh, I watched him grow and mature over the years uh, in nuclear cardiology, where he has now become really a, a superb nuclear cardiologist, uh, clinician, and physician scientist. And uh, Dr. Almala uh, did his uh, training at the American University of Beirut in Lebanon for his medical degree. He then came to the United States and, and spent time at Henry Ford Hospital, Wayne State University in the Brigham uh, in Massachusetts. And uh, ultimately, uh, several years ago, went to uh, Saudi Arabia, where he actually started an imaging, uh, a PET imaging center at the King Abdulaziz uh, Cardiac Center, where he did thousands of PET studies every year. Uh, he has published multiple uh, 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 editorials and, and peer-reviewed papers over the years in, in prestigious journals. He's on multiple uh, uh, editorial boards for, for cardiology and nuclear cardiology. And most importantly, and what I'm most pleased about in, talk, in terms of talking about Dr. Amala, is he is now part of the Methodist family. And he is one of our uh, new uh, 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 acquisitions in cardiology. He, uh, he uh, is uh, now a partner with us in, in our cardiology practice, and he is director of the PET imaging program here at the Methodist Hospital, which uh, will be starting in uh, two to three months, hopefully, if we can get, uh, if we can get uh, all the construction done that needs to be done for this particular uh, endeavor. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Amala, who will be giving uh, this year's Verani Lectureship. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, John, for the kind introduction, and good morning, everyone. I'm honored and pleased to be here today and give the 17th annual Verona Lectureship. Um, I've known John for many years through the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology and uh, working with him on the board and during his presidency and after, and I've learned a lot from John uh, through the years. So I want to start with a few words about Mario Virani, although I have never worked with him, but I've learned a lot about Mario every year through the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology, where Mario has also a lectureship over there, and uh, he's been one of the founders of the Society of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology and the 1997 president there. But what Mario is well known also for through the field is his contributions to nuclear cardiology, many of which we take for granted. But they were first described in this hospital by Mario and his team, including John. So in 1978, they first described that fixed defects are not always scarred. That's the basis of our viability imaging. In 1978, they also looked at the accuracy of thallium stress testing. 1988, they were the first to use system EB to size acute myocardial infarctions, something that we do routinely now without thinking in nuclear cardiology. And as you already heard, in 1990, they introduced adenosine, which is probably the most used mode of stress testing until Rigadenosone came uh, later on. But there have been a lot of technological advances in the field over the past few years. This is how a spec scan looked like back in 1997, and this is how a spec CT looks like nowadays. So there have been a lot of hardware advancement, and now there's even like new detectors and CZTs, uh, CZT detectors that we are utilizing in spec imaging. Similarly, this is how a PET scan looked many years ago. A PET scanner looked many years ago, which was only 2D system, and now we have a full digital 3D PET CT with new crystals in there, and there have been a lot of interest in this new imaging technology, primarily in oncology, but also it has spilled into cardiology. And the main advantages of PET over SPECT is that primarily it's high spatial depth independent resolution. We have excellent specific sensitivity and contrast resolution, and we have higher efficiency. And I'm going to emphasize all of th these throughout the lecture and show you where does PET in here work in here. This is primarily because we use agents that are higher energy, so we are able to use 511 keV radioisotopes. We have better spatial resolution, and despite using higher energy, we have much less radiation dose because uh, our ha the half-life of these agents is much less and thus the patient exposure is much less. As of now, pharmacologic stress testing if we're doing myocardial perfusion imaging is the mainstay to utilize in here. So what I plan to do over the coming 40 minutes or so, I'll show you where does PET in, fit in into a busy cardiology clinical practice. Some of us might think that PET is primarily myocardial perfusion imaging, but there are much, much more than myocardial perfusion imaging in PET. We can talk about viability imaging or metabolic imaging. We can look at patients with post-cardiac transplant. We can look in cardiomyopathies, both sarcoid, amyloid, but there are many more to come. We can look at endocarditis, and we can now look also in vascular diseases with looking at aortic aneurysms and others. And finally, there are new emerging applications in valvular heart disease. I thought instead of going in depth on one of the topics, I'll give you more of a general overview of all these topics, and later on, hopefully in different occasions, we can go in depth on each one of them in different lectures. So if we start with myocardial perfusion imaging, we mainly utilize rubidium and or ammonia. These are the two FDA-approved agents that are utilized. Ammonia needs a cyclotron, and we're lucky here to have a cyclotron in the Research Institute. And it, is, it has a half-life of about 10 minutes, and it has probably the best resolution among the ones that we are utilizing. Uh, rubidium is ideal for a busy practice if you have m much more patients because it's generator-based. You can just put it next to the scan and image the patient. 
and it has a half-life of 76 seconds. The image quality is a little bit less than ammonia, but now with the new reconstruction techniques, things have improved significantly. But now there are hope for newer radio tracers, and we are here, one of the sites, looking at a new radio tracer called Flopiridas, which is an F-18 agent. And now it's in phase three trials, looking at its comparison with SPECT imaging. So I'll show you here a couple examples. This is a patient that, if you look at the anterior wall, you wouldn't even guess that there is a defect in there. It looks normal, and this is how it would be interpreted on a SPECT image. But this patient, when he underwent fluperidas imaging, there's clearly a perfusion defect that was not detected by SPECT imaging. When you look at this study, you can start to think maybe normal, maybe abnormal, maybe inferior wall uh, attenuation correction. I want to see prone. So there might be some issues with the quality of the scan given the body habitus of the patient or image acquisition. But when you look at the fluperidas PET images, it's clearly that the study is normal. You're not going to hinge on it. So it does improve our diagnostic accuracy and also certainty when we are providing these reports. Hopefully this agent passes the level, th the, um, the, uh, the uh, phase three trials and it will make it to clinical practice, making PET way more available. So cardiac PET also, compared to the many hours that the patient spent with SPECT imaging here to get their study, whether it's a single day or two day protocol, can be completed within 25 minutes. Sometimes the image reconstruction takes longer than the patient time on the table because of the higher efficiency that we have through this. So it, it, it's a test that patients like, especially if you have a uh, p quick indication to go for operation or prior discharge, this is a quick test that can be done. In terms of accuracy, these are the most recent accuracy data that came out. This is data from the Brigham looking at Rigadenosin rubidium, where the gold standard is just in geography. And you can see here that the normalcy rate is 97, sensitivity is about 90%. When compared to FFR, imaging in the Pacific trial, now we have a sensitivity of 87 and specificity of 84. But how does that compare to other imaging modalities? So the only trial that I'm aware of that compared in the same patients, SPECT, PET, and CT is a Pacific trial. 208 studies, 208 patients that underwent the three imaging modalities and went to the cat lab, got FFR of their three vessels. And you can see here that compared to all the other imaging modalities, PET is much better in terms of accuracy. So we can say now that PET is uh, probably the highest accurate, the most accurate test in that we have available. So why is that? Why is PET the most accurate in terms of myocardial perfusion imaging? The first one is the superb image quality. So instead of showing you my data, I'll show you a published case here. This is a patient that was published, 43-year-old woman with a BMI of 43. This is the image that were acquired on an old machine, non-attenuation corrected. And I guess neither Dr. Mamerian nor myself would like to read these scans. If you want to do attenuation corrections, images improve, but probably not to the point that we are still eager to read them. But then when you look at the rubidium in the same patient, you can see now the difference in image quality in the same patient. Uh, we used to have a uh, heavy bariatric, patient, uh, bariatric surgery program in my prior job, and we had some patients that are really obese. So this is a patient with a BMI of 62. My record was 68. And this is a bariatric patient. And this is the image quality we got on this patient. So you can tell that you can definitely get much better image quality. Yes, it is filtered, but still uh, the image quality is nothing compared to spec because of the higher energy uh, that we have for the radioisotopes. Another aspect that we, why PET is the most sensitive test or most accurate test is because we measure the true peak LV ejection fraction. So in spec imaging, we image the patients like four or five, uh, 45 minutes after their stress test. Here, we are imaging them while they're being stressed. So if there is a drop in ejection fraction, 
then we are able to gather this information. These stress images are acquired while the patient is in vasodilation or on dobutamine, if they receive dobutamine. So we gathered their ejection fraction and data from Sharmila Durbala showed many years ago that if these patients did not increase or drop their ejection fraction by 5%, you're pretty certain that these patients might have three vessel or left main disease. And this adds also incremental prognostic value. So those who do not increase their LVF with vasodilator stress, these patients actually have increased risk of events. We also do a concomitant calcium score on those patients who have no known coronary disease. And this, yes, can be done with SPECT, but helps us identify those patients who have atherosclerosis in addition to stenosis. But the main contribution of PET actually has been the issue of absolute myocardial blood flow quantification. So we can get coronary flow reserve non-invasively. We use it with dynamic acquisition. So similar to what we do with MRI, we gather quick acquisitions through the right ventricle as the rubidium or ammonia is moving through. And then we do our time activity curves to gather information about the um, about the concentration as it uh, at the radio tracer passes through the LV and into the myocardium, and using some mathematical modeling, we can uh, calculate the absolute myocardial blood flow in there. And there have been some studies showing that if you have a normal myocardial blood flow that has a very high negative predictive value for left main or three vessel disease. So those patients who have normal myocardial blood flow, it's almost 3% chance of having left main or three vessel disease. This was confirmed also in another study in, uh, from Ottawa. It does predict events. So those patients who do not have ischemia, these patients actually have worse outcome if their CFR is low. And similarly, those who have significant ischemia their outcome is much worse if they have low CFR at the same level of amount of ischemia. And it may potentially guide us to who to revascularize. This is a retrospective observational study from Mid-America Heart Institute where they started on PET back in 2006. So now they have 12,000 patients with almost 10 years outcomes. They just presented this three weeks ago. It's not in publication yet at the American Heart Association. Where they looked at the outcome of these patients and they looked at the impact of early revascularization. Uh, what you see here that these lines cross similar to what we've seen with the extent of ischemia. So technically those who have a myocardial blood uh, CFR less than 1.8, they had the benefit from revascularization with early <coughs> with early revascularization, while those with the CFR more than 1.8 actually had a ha higher mortality with revascularization. This is obviously registry data and need to be validated and we'll be waiting for the full publication of this data. Because of all of this, now we can, when we read PET, we have most of the time, we're either in the definitely abnormal or definitely normal range. We don't get these probably normal, probably abnormal. This is also Tim Bateman data, where he looked at his own reports. And this is like experts in the field and have been doing nuclear cardiology for many years. So their experience is not questioned. And you can see that there is still a spec they get about 7% probably normal, 5% probably abnormal with uh, spec but and some equivocals, but you can clearly see that with PET, this is almost wiped out and you are in the definite group in there because of the much better image quality that you get with this. And you do all of this with much, much less radiation dose. So it depends on the system you're using. So if you have one of the new systems, the 3D systems, you inject much lower dose of uh, radioisotope not to saturate the crystal. And then technically you end up with almost two, 2.5 millisiever compared to, for example, the days of thallium where we were injecting much higher doses, almost 20 or 30 millicuries, depends on the amount of isotope injected. So enough for myocardial perfusion imaging. Let's move on to other areas where PET can help, although still the bulk of the application is going to be in myocardial perfusion imaging because of this is the most ordered test in terms of, uh, of workup. But there are many other applications in terms of cardiac PET. 
So in terms of imaging and heart failure, now we're going to start talking about metabolic imaging and FDG imaging. So we utilize the characteristic of the myocardium where the normal myocardium likes to utilize free fatty acid. So if you're not eating and you're starting to fast, the normal myocytes like to have free fatty acid. However, if these myocytes get to the point where there is hibernation and there is tight stenosis, these patients, uh, these myocytes are going to switch from free fatty acid to glucose. We utilize that in our viability imaging. So if a patient is referred for ischemic cardiomyopathy, we might end up with significant ischemia as we see here. So this is a clear ischemic cardiomyopathy with significant ischemia, but you might see a fixed defect in there. So there is a severe defect, and this might tell us that either there is a tight stenosis and our radio tracer did not make it to these cells, and or these cells are hibernating. So we go ahead and do FDG, and you can see in the same area now that we see significant uptake of FDG. This means that these cells are alive and they took fluorodeoxyglucose inside and these cells now are metabolically active. So with revascularization, we hope that we can recover this function. While in this patient here, you see that there is little reversibility or we call it a match defect. And this is a patient that will probably not going to recover from revascularization. So unfortunately, this test is not the most commonly used test. What is most commonly used outside are these, this is thallium viability. And I'll show you one case at where PET can make a difference. This is a patient of mine that uh, had a viability back in 2010 using thallium. This is before we had PET in my practice. And you clearly see that only the lateral wall on delayed imaging only the lateral wall has thallium uptake, but there is no uptake on the anterior wall, no uptake on the septum, no uptake on the inferior wall. And this was correctly based on this imaging modality called SCAR, and this patient most likely is not going to benefit from revascularization of the LAD or the RCA. This patient had multiple admissions for heart failure, and now we have PET available, so let's put him through the PET system. And this is the same patient three years later, you can see whatever you did not see in the anterior wall, now you can see that despite that, there's still significant uptake. Even before we did the metabolic imaging with rubidium, you can see also the inferior wall is there. Yes, there is a scar, but the scar is small, not as much as overestimated by thallium imaging. So you can see that, unfortunately, the most commonly used test is probably underestimating viability in many patients given the technical characteristics of the test that is being used. And there is some, some data to suggest that it is helpful in making decisions. This is the part two trial, and this is the on-treatment uh, analysis. So looking at those who adhere to PET recommendation, even up to five years, there might be a survival benefit uh, for using FTG versus uh, FTG PET to guide therapy versus standard therapy. Although the primary endpoint, if you take everybody on, on uh, intention to treat analysis, this trial was not significant. Some of these patients are going to have advanced heart failure and they're going to proceed to have uh, cardiac transplant. And as our heart failure colleagues tell us, they need to look for rejection often, and you do biopsies, and sometimes you try to do CTs, but some of these patients are going to develop renal failure, and you need to look for some non potentially non-invasive tool to look for contrast for uh, allograft uh, vasculopathy. And the question that has come up often is that can we use vasodilator stress? Is it safe to do it for this? And what about can we detect coronary artery vasculopathy? So in terms of the safety of adenosine or regadenosine, we looked at adenosine a long time ago. And we can see here that, yes, there, there are some second and third degree AV block with these patients. We even had sinus poses and about 102 transplant patients. But once regadenosine gets in, and this is a re-paper that just came out from the University of Michigan group, and you can see that they had almost 0% with regadenosine in terms of second, third, or sinus pauses. 
However, these heart failure patients, uh, sorry, heart transplant patients are going to complain of much more dyspnea compared to the advanced registry, which is the non-transplant patient. So these patients is self-limited and it's not going to result in stopping the test, but it's just a side effect to be aware of. So can we detect increase in myocardial blood flow? And here you see this is a transplant patient and there is nice increase in coronary flow reserve in this patient, while another patient there was no increase in, my car in coronary flow reserve. How accurate is this to detect coronary vasculopathy? So the Brigham group had about 66 patients who had PET coronary flow reserve transplant patients, and then they went for angiography. And this is the result. The negative predictive value is the, probably the most important here, 96%. So technically, if you have a PET scan, it's normal normal myocardial blood flow, you're almost sure that there is no, contra no uh, coronary vasculopathy. And it did predict the outcome in this group. And so those who had uh, CAV had worse outcome. And this has also been validated in 140 patients from the Ottawa group, similarly showing that there was an increased risk of events among those patients with reduced myocardial blood flow. So heart failure is not only ischemic, we can get also the different ca cardiomyopathies that you work out, and still MRI has a big role in there. But I think also PET can provide some additional information in this patient population. So the two areas where PET has made significant advances are the inflammatory cardiomyopathies, especially sarcoidosis, and also the uh, amyloidosis. So I'll share with you some of the early work. This is a case of uh, ours that came in. And you see that we did rubidium imaging for this patient who was suspected to have cardiac sarcoidosis, and there was a perfusion defect in there. Now, a perfusion defect in this patient could be because of this of uh, coronary disease. So most of these patients, we ruled out coronary disease in these patients. Or it could be because there is a lot of inflammation there. So there is edema and there are macrophages and non caseating granulomas in there. So we don't get this perfusion defect. When we give FDG, but in a different protocol than viability. So now I'm not trying to image the myocytes. I'm going to try to image the macrophages that are sitting in there, now I see that there is high intensity of uptake in the same area. So it uh, clearly tells you that there are a lot of macrophages that sit there. The preparation for this protocol, we suppress the myocardial glucose uptake by giving these patients a lot of free fatty acids. So we tell them eat a lot of butter. We actually bring f eggs and butter and fry them. And we tell them this is the only time as a cardiologist I'm going to allow you to do that and don't do it after. So we want to increase the free fatty acid. We inject heparin before we do this, and we are able to image the macrophages because we want to inhibit the myocytes from uptaking that. And now we can see that there is this area, which is almost a mirror image, tells us that there is a lot of inflammation there. So you can see the perfusion defect, see the uptake of FDG. But we can also see it in other areas, so we can detect it in isolated RV sarcoidosis, as you see in here. So you have patients actually who have um, RV uh, delayed enhancement and they have RV FTG uptake. You can also look at those patients who have extra cardiac sarcoidosis because the same concept, macrophages sitting anywhere, we can potentially detect it in the lung, in the mediastinum, and some groups are even advocating that for these patients, you may do a whole body uh, PET scan, try to detect if there are granulomas or inflammation anywhere else. So the role between CMR and PET is probably more complementary than the, rather than competitive because each one of them are imaging a different aspect. You can start with CMR, and if you have a patient with low suspicion and you have a normal CMR, that almost rules out cardiac sarcoid. But if you have a patient that high suspicion, you probably should go for PET because we do have, we have seen some discordances in this group. If the CMR is inconclusive or positive, I think it's important to go for PET because we want to determine the disease activity. Because in CMR, if a patient with cardiac sarcoid had one attack of cardiac sarcoid, it may last there for some time, the delayed enhancement. So you don't know if it is now acute or it is chronic. So technically, once you get that, 
you try to see if there are active inflammation in there. And you can use it not only that, you can use it also to follow the response to therapy. So once you put these patients on steroids and other immunosuppressive therapies, you can follow that. So this is a case where you have actually some subtle findings. I'm not sure if they're projecting well on the MRI where there are some small areas of delayed enhancement. But clearly when they did the PET, there is actually clear myocardial uptake, even though there is not even a perfusion defect, but there is clear FTG uptake in there. And this patient was treated, and then they were brought back to image them. And now we don't see any FTG uptake. This is all blood pooled, so it's all in the LV cavity. There is nothing that's making it to the myocardium. And this is where um, the beauty of this test, you can go back and repeat it and measure the disease activity and response to therapies. Amyloidosis is another area where also MRI has a lot of impact, but obviously uh, with MRI we can detect this pattern, which is pretty sensitive and specific in the 80s or so. But now we have other nuclear imaging tools. With SPECT PYP imaging, we can detect whether there is ATTR or AL type. With ATTR, we have significant uh, PYP uptake. With AL, there is no uptake. But now we have even more amyloid-specific uh, radio tracers with PET that will help us determine this. So there is a fluorbitabir where there is no uptake in the controls, but with the AL, with the ATTR, actually there is some uptake, but the highest uptake is actually, and the CRISPR images are with the AL type. So now we're not like detecting it by inference, but rather with certainty that this is AL. And this is the work of Shermila Durbala from the Brigham looking at this, and you can see that there is no uptake with the uh, control, and there is not significant overlap even between the uh, AL and ATTR. And these are like small numbers, yes, and need to be verified in larger sample sizes. I think another area where PET is making a huge now impact, especially uh, in uh, different patient population as the patient's population's age are actually in endocarditis. And this is an area where <coughs> echo is still the first line test, but there are some times where you cannot be certain about whether this patient has endocarditis or not. And you can use FTG in a similar protocol to the protocol to the sarcoid, now trying to image the white blood cells and the vegetations uh, in there. So you can see here there is no uptake. And this is a patient with endocarditis with significant uptake, and there's like almost an abscess around the valve. You can see it also in patients who have grafts, and they have gra infection in the grafts or multiple abscesses in there with the CT. But you can also look at it um, potentially post therapy and try to see how much uh, these patients are responding. Even now, there are they're looking at some even some. TAVR infections, especially now with these hypoattenuated lesions. So you can see that you can detect if there is specific uptake with FDG in there and try to detect if these patients have infections in there. Uh, how accurate is this technique? It is also a challenging and starting to grow, but the pool sensitivity from the meta-analysis is about 81%, specificity is about 85%. So there's still some work to enhance it, and there are some technical things that you might do to be able to enhance it as much as you can. But still, it adds on to echocardiography. So if you see something in echo and you have FTG uptake in that same territory, you're more confident rather than just not seeing anything on echo to tell you, to guide you where to look for this FTG uptake. And unfortunately, it's not in the American guidelines that as I'm aware of, but it's made it to the European guidelines. Most of these studies were done in Europe. So you can see here where it fits in, in the guidelines among those patients with possible endocarditis, where you're not sure, you have not completed the due criteria, and you're still in the possible range, then you can do FTG PET. And also among patients with definitive endocarditis, if you're looking for potential complications. So all of these have been uh, helpful, but we don't look only at valves, we can look also at any other potential infection. We can look at pacemakers. So this is a patient who has a pocket infection, and you can see that there is an infection, or sometimes you see uh, patients with fever and there's something flickering on the lead and you try to gather information about uh, whether there's infection. You can look also at patients with LVADs. 
So you can try to gather whether what you see on CT or echo is an infection. So if you see significant FTG uptake, that will guide you that this is an infection. And this is work of Vasken Decision from uh, University of Maryland, where he looked at nearly 35 patients with ALVAS, and they characterized the location of the infection, whether it's in the percutaneous exit, or whether it's in the drive line, as you see in here, or whether it's in the device itself. And obviously, in terms of outcome, those who have infection in the device have the worst outcome compared to those who did not have any infection or who had it more on the periphery. So this is paper that just came out yesterday in the um, Jack Imaging, but it's an important paper to tell us that we can potentially help in this patient population uh, to detect infections. I want to touch base on some applications that might be helpful. Some of them, this, this did not make it to clinical practice yet, but I think it has a lot of hope, especially for our vascular colleagues, because PET imaging has significant, uh, have been in, uh, implicated and people have been interested to look at uh, different vasculatures, whether inflammatory vasculopathies, but also among atherosclerotic vasculopathies like abdominal aortic aneurysms or other uh, lesions. And we try to see whether there is any chance to determine which aneurysm, for example, could expand rapidly versus those that stay dormant for some time or those that are at risk of uh, uh, rupture. So this study done in the, uh, uh, Scotland and by the Edinburgh group where they looked at a new tracer now we're going to introduce it. it's called sodium fluoride. Sodium fluoride is a tracer that looks at uh, micronodules of calcification. So uh, this one actually is primarily utilized in prostate cancer patients and uh, to look for bone metastasis. So now if you have some of the, if you are try to apply it to in cardiovascular where areas of microcalcification, then it might help you determine potentially which aneurysms or which vascular calcification is still unstable and there is some inflammation to guide you with therapy. There is not much data in there. Just to let you know that FDG data in this patient population has not been very positive. Some studies were positive, some studies were negative, and did not yield a lot of uh, enthusiasm in there. But the data from sodium fluoride, you can see here, because it's a bone tracer, so all the bones will light up. But this is a patient who has an aneurysm, and you can see here the aneurysm is lighting up too. So you can localize it and try to look at this aneurysm. So you can see here also in cross-section, this is the aneurysm. You see sodium fluoride uptake in there. And in this study of nearly about 70 patients or so, the uptake of sodium fluoride actually was associated with the risk of abdominal aortic aneurysm expansion. It did correlate with the risk of abdominal aortic rupture and also the need for abdominal aortic repair. So maybe we have a new hint that this tracer might help us determine the rate that we scan these patients. Some of them are getting a lot of scans for CTs and aneurysms, so maybe we can, it might guide us to determine uh, does this patient require a yearly CT or maybe longer if they have, uh, if they have significant uptake in there. And finally, I want to finish up with also another potential application in valvular heart disease using the same tracer. So we have also calcifications on the valve, right? So this is a, an elegant study done by the same group in Edinburgh. And you can look at those patients who have aortic sclerosis or moderate aortic stenosis, and there is some calcification in there, but there is not much in terms of that you can see in there in terms of calcification. So they did sodium fluoride, and you can see here that there's a lot of uptake. That's very high uptake in sodium fluoride. Even though in this area where there's uptake, there is no uh, calcification. So they brought the patients, waited on them a couple years, and then they brought them back again and tried to image them. And you can sure now you have calcifications in the same territory that there was sodium fluoride. So it might also help you guide 
whether these patients are going to progress into uh, worsening uh, of their aortic sclerosis or stenosis. And this is actually some patients who have, uh, some of them have worsened uh, their gradients, not only calcification, but gradients and degree of aortic stenosis. And they recently presented in the American College of Cardiology meeting their data looking at uh, bioprosthetic valve degeneration. So you can see here those patients who have actually increased FD, uh, sodium fluoride uptake have actually has been associated with increase in the uh, rate of degeneration. So I hope that I've shown you a lot of the applications for uh, cardiac uh, PET in there. If you want to learn more about it, we have our multimodality imaging conference here where we discuss more in depth some of these applications in there. But you can see that PET is not only myocardial perfusion imaging. We have a big menu there. And hopefully, we'll bring these to the, to the patients here at Methodist. And I can potentially conclude that it's not a luxury, especially for a quaternary, quaternary care that we have here with the type of patients that we see. It is a must. So going back to our program here, so talking to the uh, hospital leadership a couple days ago, so we were confirmed that the order for the machine has been approved and hopefully will be out soon. And construction site, it will be on OPC 16. Construction site will start in January. So let's keep praying for these workers to work hard <laughs> to get this imaging machine <laughs> up and running. So going back to uh, the theme of this lecture, which is Mario Verani. So I was thinking if Mario was here in 2018, what would Mario say uh, with the field of nuclear cardiology the way it is? I think he will say, let's get into PET. Let's make nuclear cardiology great again. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>what is the potential for ultimately plaque imaging in the coronary bed? Because, I mean, that's been the, like the holy grail for like 15 years, and nothing has really surfaced very, very, very large in this area. And then my second question is, what about microvascular dysfunction, microvascular imaging? Uh, because we keep hearing about it all the time uh, in terms of normal epicardium, normal epicardial arteries and yet people having chest pain and having microvascular disease. Where do you think PET can help elucidate some of these, some, not only the mechanisms, but potential, you know, identifying how you might treat this disease? So two great questions. Uh, the first one looking at the coronary uh, high-risk plaques. And this is an area where, as John mentioned, there have been a lot of hype, but also a lot of disappointment in the data. People try to use uh, FTG a lot in there. But because the myocardium likes FTG, if you give it, and especially with insulin, so it's just, you don't get a good signal with FTG. However, the Edinburgh group recently also published, I intentionally did not put it in there because this is still more of a research application, that using sodium fluoride also in the plaque was associated. So they brought patients with acute AMI, they had a stent, and then they took them the next day to the PET lab, injected sodium fluoride, and imaged the plaque. And the culprit plaque actually highlighted, uh, like lighted up significantly. Sodium fluoride is not normally uptaken by the myocardium, so technically it should be easier. However, this is like the only study, and uh, in terms of other plaque characteristics, CT is making a lot of leap in there. So looking at different plaque characteristics, napkin sign, positive remodeling, and correlation with IVIS and OCT, I think it is probably now an equipose, but uh, to see which one will eventually win. But with the availability of CT and the number of CTs being done, I think more plaque uh, imaging will go to CT rather than PET and MR. My other guess in terms of uh, microvascular dysfunction, so we do uh, 
we see a lot of patients, especially with multiple comorbidities, they have chest pain. We do coronary angiography or coronary CT angio, they look normal. But when we do a PET scan for them, we have decreased CFR for these patients. And actually, these patients truly have decrease in uh, significant symptoms and decrease in their CFR. And there have been now some interest in using some medications, specifically ralonazine, to try to see if we can bring these patients, put them on ralonazine, and then bring them back again and see if their CFR improved. This is kind of where we are in terms of status or like potentially giving them statins and others. So this is an area of excitement. You can also do it like they did in the Y study, do it with CMR and try to get uh, perfusion imaging with these. But I think this is an important area where uh, we can actually help these patients and identify, yes, it's not in their head. It's probably truly in their hearts. <laughs> yes. Ross, thank you. Uh, thank you for, for the great lecture. And I think the multimodality has not been complete until we have the PET and you starting here for our imaging section. We're very excited to have PET, especially in cardiomyopathy. I think, as we were talking earlier, there's a lot of elusive non-ischemic cardiomyopathy that happens. Sarcoid especially becomes very underdiagnosed. My question to you is how specific is FDG being taken up by the macrophages versus can you get a wrong signal by a lot of lymphocytes and, and can we put our money on it? Because the problem becomes on biopsies for these patchy disease, a lot of times it, it's missed no matter what you do. So if someone has that FDG positive, are we 100% specific or what do you have yeah, any biopsy studies? I, I think the problem with sarcoid imaging, it's technically challenging because you really have to suppress the myocardium. And I can tell you that we will fail sometimes. I had some cases where the patient will, especially outpatients, so the preparation for that scan will start 24 hours before. The patient should not have any carbohydrate. If they have any carbohydrate, the test will not work. Plus, in addition to not having any carbohydrate, they should have a high fat meal. They fast for some time. And then just right before, we give them like really a lot of free fatty acid. Some people have used the heparin in there. So all of these, the technicality still, you may not suppress the myocardium. So you, are, you would like to gather information about how accurate this diet was uh, followed up so that you have, uh, you have inhibited the F normal FDG uptake of the myocardium. And sometimes we had to, some patients who are non-compliant, we admitted them, so we monitor exactly what they are eating in the 24 hours before, so we are sure that they are well prepared. Um, it's not uh, going to be 100%. There's nothing 100% in medicine, but at least I can tell you that there is inflammation. Whether it is macrophage, whether lymphocyte or neutrophil, that's probably beyond the technique, the ability. And then you have to go more into like other labeling techniques specific for these cells or CD4 labeling techniques that will allow you to identify the specific cells. But the biggest challenge is really the preparation for the test, whether in infection or in sarcoid. Um, Dr. Mal, this is a great lecture. I have one question regarding um, imaging for vegetations. So at times when you do transesophageal echo, whether it's on a pacemaker lead or perhaps it's on a bioprosthetic valve, sometimes it's uncertain. You may see some thickening. You may see some what can appear to be a vegetation. It could also be a thrombus. And so the question I have is, would this be helpful in that scenario in terms of an increased FDG uptake, pointing more towards infection and less towards thrombus and help us in that clinical dilemma? Or Absolutely, you got it right. So if there is increased FDG uptake, it will point you more toward the infection. And remember, this is, these are not two separate entities, right? You could have a thrombus. I mean, a vegetation is thrombin that got infected in there. So you have the two processes in there. And whatever today is not infected may get infected the next day, especially in dialysis patients or long indwelling catheters. So I think it's very important to try to image these patients to help you, guide you one way or the other. So although, although Dr. Sogby is out of town, he's watching live. So he just texted me to ask you. <laughs> As you see evolution of PET and CT and so forth, 
Are you predicting that SPEC will become obsolete? Okay, so I, technically, if you ask me about SPEC going, I don't think so. I mean, right now in the, in the US, there are about 200 plus sites doing cardiac patch. And how many sites doing cardiac spec? How many physicians have spec cameras in the machine? I don't think PET is going to be able to replace the need for the volume. But I think what will happen is that more tertiary care centers will have more PET in there, and less of it is going to be more spec in these situations. Plus, remember, we are still doing with PET, we're going to do a lot of pharmacologic stress testing. So if you want to gather information about exercise, Unless Fluperidas got approved, we're still tied to the exercise capability. There are also advances in SPEC. SPEC is not going to go away because there are advances in technology. Yes, now with the new CZT detector, you can image also with about two to three millisiever if you do a single day protocol low dose. So advances, and now there are some research work still it's in infancy to try to quantify CFR in SPEC too. So I think, the, both are going to be essential. I think there will be more PET, definitely more PET, but I don't think to the point that it will wipe out SPECT. SPECT is going to continue to be there, especially with the new technological advances there. Uh, just one question. There's a group of vascular diseases that we find very difficult to diagnose, but I would suspect that PET would be able to do that, and that is the inflammatory vasculitis like giant cell arteritis. Right now we rely on silly blood tests like SED rate and, you know, in a clinical diagnosis. So in the conference I'll, in the uh, February, I'll present a few cases. We had actually a case of Takayasu where it was confirmed and we have very nice FTG uptake. So technically using FTG in this patient population will help you. It's still an unapproved, it's like off-label indication. But using it, uh, it will help you in determining uh, if there is FTG uptake that's probably more uh, related to inflammation in there. So it's not going to be specific to that one. Any inflammation will light up with FTG. So, but it will be a g in the right clinical scenario, in the right clinical setting with someone with constitutional symptoms, high ESR, and something else suggested on CT or MRI, FDG will help you confirm the diagnosis and also potentially monitor therapy because once you give them therapy, their FDG uptake should go down. So, so was a great talk and we're excited to have you here and, and excited to have PET here hopefully uh, soon. I think you convinced all of us that um, about what a great resource it is. I wish you could have given your whole talk on heart failure, but um, yeah. <laughs> I, so I know you, it was comprehensive. I have to and my, everyone. <laughs> yeah. So one question is that one thing I, you probably didn't have time for is the application of, of PET for for inflammatory myocarditis, and wanted if you had any brief comments on that and and maybe comparative efficacy versus MRI. So inflammatory myocarditis, again, is probably going to fall close to the sarcoid kind of group. I'm not aware of too much literature in there. There is an abstract I've seen in ESC last meeting, which I have not seen the paper yet. And they actually looked at 300 plus patients with myocarditis presumed to be viral using the same protocol as sarcoid. They've shown that there is FTG uptake and the FTG uptake correlated with MRI in there. But I'm not sure that in, like, in terms of viral, how does it stand compared to myocarditis, to sarcoid. But remember, sarcoid is a f form of myocarditis, right? It's another way of myocarditic process in there. So theoretically, it should work, but I'm not aware of too many papers looking at that. Okay, well, uh, again, Moaz, thank you so much for your lecture today. I think it was really enlightening, and uh, we all look forward to doing a lot more pet studies in the future. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>